Hey guys, today is going to be a very special uh, broadcast. I believe this is going to bless you. This is Vlad and Pastor Brian Worth. He is from Los Angeles, California. He's here with me for a few days. I had a chance to be at his church uh, about a month ago, a month and a half ago. Uh, God is doing great things. He has a powerful testimony and today you're going to hear not only his testimony, I believe you're going to be blessed but also you're going to learn a very powerful lesson for those of you that are maybe praying for somebody or for those of you that are struggling with forgiveness. Today is going to be a powerful, powerful um, video for you. So before we go before we go anywhere, make sure you hit thumbs up, share this with somebody because this is about to be incredible encounter you're going to have with God. So Pastor Brian, you were not always a pastor. No, no. A lot of pastors were not always pastors. That's true. That's true, but uh but your story is is crazy. Your story is crazy. You are uh I call him the Moses like Moses story or the story wow. of Apostle Paul. You know like Moses had a, had somebody uh uh, <laughs> that didn't live very long and stuff. So before you came to Christ, tell us about your life before Christ and what actually uh, took you to prison. Yes. So I grew up in the Los Angeles uh, area and it was really infested by gangs and drugs. And uh, my house was like what they called the kickback house for the local gang members. So I would watch the gang members do drugs when I was little at my house and mm -hmm. drink alcohol at my house and I remember drinking alcohol for the first time probably at 10 at years 10 old years probably of around 10 years old oh, they used goodness. to play what they call quarters where they would throw the quarter on uh -huh. the table and it would go into the alcohol uh, cup uh -huh. but those gang members took care of me oh, and really? they fed me and eventually I became one of them and was it because like you grew up like was there a home broken home environment that kind of created that? Or? I yeah, I had a broken home. My mom and dad were never married. They had kids uh, in previous relationships and okay. I was going through a custody battle mm. between my mom and my dad. So there was a bitter war going mm -hmm. on between my mom and dad. Wow. And so the gang members provided they were a family to me. You know, I heard somebody says when elephants fight, grass suffers. Mm. You know, when parents fight, a lot of times children, you know, they look for that acceptance. Oh. And, you, and you found that in gangs. Yes, I found it in gangs. They took care of me. They became brothers and sisters to me. But as as crazy mm. as it sounds, they told me when I was little, I would, I swore I would never be a gang member. I actually said I would really? never be a gang member because my oldest brother got shot and killed at the age of 15 years old by a gang member. When he was 15. When he was 15 years old, got shot in the face by another gang member. So I swore I would never be a gang member, but the pull was mm -hmm. too strong to resist. And then you pretty much gave in? I gave in and eventually I started talking like them, dressing like them. Like for sixth grade, when we would have Halloween at school, everybody would come in costumes. I came as a gang member. I wore my brother's clothes as a gang member in the sixth grade. Wow. So eventually I officially, at the, around the age 12 years old, I what we call got jumped into the gang officially, mm -hmm. but I grew up there. Mm -hmm. And then what that, what things that, I mean, we don't want to glorify darkness or a past life of sin, but what are some things when you were in gangs that you did? Well, I grew up in the late 80s and the early 90s. That's when gangster rap bursted on the scene, mm -hmm. particularly in Los Angeles. There was a gang warfare mm -hmm. going on. So I got caught up in that culture of violence, of wanting to getting shot at and shooting people and hanging out on the streets. Mm -hmm. I was a runaway. Mm -hmm. every, every chance, every time I didn't get my way at home, I ran away from home. I slept in the streets. I slept in the park. But at the same time, I was not an evil kid, Vlad. Mm. Like my dad taught me the fear of God when I was little. Mm. So I had a fear of God inside of me. I didn't wake up every morning like with blood on my mouth trying to kill somebody. For me, I had a bad attitude. I would mm. not listen to wisdom. Mm. Mm -hmm. And what regrettable decision did you make that landed you in jail? Can you tell us about that moment and what led to you going to uh, going Yes. Away? Well, I was caught up in some gang warfare in Los Angeles in 1992. And 1992 was the highest murder rate of Los Angeles, by the way. I was 16 years old and my friend had a gun and I made a mistake one day and I got the gun and I put it in my car, I hid it in my car. And I'll never forget the moment I touched that gun, 
I felt something. Wow. And the way I describe it was like a false sense of bravado or bravery. Mm -hmm. And it, it changed me, but I had it turned mm. me into somebody else. And so I would drive around with this gun thinking I was invincible. Wow. And one day we skipped school and we drove around to our, just to have, try to look for fun. Mm -hmm. Cause you don't wake up in the morning and want to kill nobody. Yeah, That's yeah. unless you're a psychopath, you don't say, Oh, today's a good day to kill somebody. Mm -hmm. No, usually you take steps in the wrong direction. Mm. And I skipped school. We went and to sometimes it's the unwise decisions or wrong small steps that we could justify and say, Well, they're not gonna lead to anything big anyway. Exactly. That's what I've learned. It's the small steps in the wrong direction wow. taken over a long period of time. Mm. And then you wake up one day and everything explodes like That's me, crazy. like me. Started off with smoking weed, not listening to my parents, skipping school. All those in and of themselves, mm -hmm. I felt, oh, that's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. But when you add them all up, eventually they explode into your, you know, they explode. So... One day, my friend and I was driving around a, a local neighborhood of a rival gang uh, enemies, mm -hmm. and we saw gang graffiti on the wall. Here's another bad decision. We said, let's spray paint on the wall because mm -hmm. that was a form of disrespect. Mm -hmm. It wasn't violence, but it's another small bad decision. Mm -hmm. So we go and we get a can of spray paint. We come back around, mm -hmm. and this time we retrace our, our route, and now there's gang members on the same street. So we pass them up, and now it's too dangerous to get out the car now. And we're like, I'm not going to get out the car. We're going to lose our life. And as I drove off, my friend asked, should we shoot at them? Should we shoot at them? And Vlad, I don't talk about this much, very rarely, yeah. but I heard something tell me, do it. Wow. I don't know if it was wow. my own sinful nature. I don't mm. know if it was a demon outside of me, but I heard something say, do it. So I slowed down, regretfully pulled the gun out of the hidden spot of my car. We drove back around and regretfully we shot at them one time and it resulted regretfully in the death of a rival gang member. All of a sudden, Vlad, as soon as that gun went off, a spirit of fear and panic and paranoia took over me. It was such a surprise. I didn't have it before, hmm. but as soon as we killed somebody, it was as if the devil turned on me. And they wow. started chasing me, and I just started try All I could think of was the movies. I was 16 years old. All I could think of was, like, getting out of there. And I ended up getting away. But the very next morning, I got arrested. Wow. And you spent about 17 years? 16 years Six, 16 in years prison. In prison. I, I, I got arrested at the age of 16 years old the very next day. They put me in a cop car. The detective t uh, told me, you better take a good look at them streets boy because you'll never see them again wow. and I was slipping into utter darkness I went to juvenile hall got booked for murder and one attempt at murder eventually got kicked out of juvenile hall went to the Los Angeles County Jail if you talk about demons Vlad Los Angeles County Jail is hell on earth that's crazy and I was 17 years old at that time with a red jumpsuit, bald head, skinnier than I am now. Look at me, Vlad. I'm not buff. I don't got tattoos all over my face. Not intimidating. Mm -hmm. I was surrounded by hyenas and lions. And eventually, I got sentenced to life in prison from the Compton, California courthouse. Life in prison. Life in prison. Not five years, not 10 years. Life in prison. And I remember they took me back to my one-man cell. I was in a one-man cell, Vlad. Mm -hmm. I could touch both sides with my hands. That's how... Uh, small it was it was dark gloomy i used to catch rats for play and as i oh, sat there with oh. my face pressed against my knees vlad it felt like the devil was laughing at me i mean it felt like a python snake was choking me out literally and i begin to regret all of a sudden and my slow life flashed before my eyes oh. but i heard a noise in the hallway vlad and i got up i looked put my face against them bars and it was an elderly Christian man passing out Christian literature to each cell mm. and I didn't want to talk to nobody I was mad at the world mm. I was condemned to die a slow death in prison but this old man wasn't even a former gang member wasn't even an ex-prisoner but he had the gospel pumping in his veins he had wow. the Holy Spirit wow. and he invaded my darkness Vlad wow. he grabbed my hands and I told him I said mister I just got sentenced to life in prison. What in the world can you do for me? 
My mama don't want me. My daddy don't want me. Society don't want me. I'm condemned to die a slow death in prison. What can you do for me? And this old man didn't budge. He stared at me with them like Clint Eastwood eyes. And he reached through the darkness of the bars and he grabbed my hand and he said a quiet yet powerful prayer over me in the name of Jesus. Like I didn't know it then, but the brother pulled out the most powerful name in the universe on, somebody. in the most darkest moment of my life. He prayed over me. So I thank God for people, Vlad, like you and Hungry Generation that are not afraid of the darkness. Mm. I thank God for Christians that invade the devil's territory and snatch out souls from wow. the kingdom of God because that's how I was born again. I wasn't born again on a church pew. I was born again in the midst of hell on earth and somebody by the power of the Holy Spirit invaded that space. Man, man, I feel, feel the presence of the Lord. If you guys are getting blessed by this if this not giving if this is not giving you chills even that's not about chills uh, then I don't know what's happening to you but hey let me know in the comments right now if this is helping somebody uh, this is blessing somebody I believe that God has a powerful powerful story uh, for each and every one of us right now so um, you get you pretty much give your life to Jesus right there and then I well about a day later God gave me a realization, Vlad. I'm in this one-man cell, Los Angeles County Jail, about to start my life sentence. At that time, I'm 17 years old, mm -hmm. and God gave me a realization. He said, Brian, sooner or later, you're going to want to serve me unless you die first. You're going to wake up in a prison yard. You're going to look up to wow. heaven. You're going to beat your chest and say, man, I wish I would have surrendered my life to the Lord. When I realized that, Vlad, I got down on my knees in that cell and I surrendered to the God that my dad taught me about when I was little. Mm -hmm. I surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And I got off on my knees and nothing changed outwardly. Like the judge didn't show up. The doors didn't open wow. up. The light didn't pop up, right? It wasn't time for me to go home. No, nothing no, outwardly nothing changed. changed. Outwardly, yeah. but something happened on the inside. Uh -huh. I believe a revolution took place on the inside of me. And the Lord did two things subsequent to that, Vlad. He gave me a vision. He said, Brian, if you serve me and don't give up, eventually I'm going to bust you free to impact the world with the gospel. Wow. And then he filled me with this Holy Spirit and power. Wow. And gave me this desire for the word of God, mm -hmm. which began to drive me forward in the midst of darkness. And there began your journey of getting out physically yes. out of jail. You had a girlfriend, actually. Yes. Who didn't give up on you and who is actually now your wife. Yes, my and wife, the, Laura, she's a miracle, Holy Spirit, powerful woman of God. We met at about age 13, 12, 13 years old on the streets. I was driving down or I was in a car. And she stuck with me throughout the whole time I was in prison. She fought for my release. She got saved a little bit after I got saved, mm -hmm. got filled with the Holy Ghost. Wow. And she is a huge, a miracle. How long did she wait for you? She waited for me for 16 years. We got married in prison July 11, 1997 in the prison visiting hall. And how long into your sentence? Well, I got arrested in 1992. We got married in 1997, so about five years into my sentence. Oh, wow. But she waited for me all That's the 16 crazy. years. We've been married now for 25 years wow. to the I, glory I of God. I met your wife. She's, his wife is amazing. She's a woman of God. They're both serving now, and uh, both are leading not just the church, but leading actually churches. Now, tell us a little bit about the breakthrough that took place and the struggle for... Um, because you were sentenced for life, you got out 16 years later. So how did that happen? Well, Vlad, they were all telling me, Brian, why are you going to high school in prison? Why are you going to church? Why are you reading your Bible? You're going to die in here just mm -hmm. like us. And when I got saved in this revival called the Gospel Light Revival, when I first started you know, serving the Lord, mm -hmm. one of the first things God taught me was about faith for some reason. Mm -hmm. Taught me about faith and power and miracles. Mm -hmm. I started mm -hmm. reading about like Smith Wigglesworth and John G. Lake, mm -hmm. and I begin to soak up these this faith. Uh -huh. I know now that God was getting my heart ready to believe for the impossible. Mm -hmm. So they were telling me I was gonna die in prison. I'm serving the Lord. I'm pursuing the vision. God is developing my character in the midst of hell on earth. I was in the furnace of affliction, Vlad. It was, it was terrible. I do not recommend going to prison to get developed in Christ. 
come to Hungry Gen <laughs> intern, <laughs> mit, internship and get developed. Do not go to prison. <laughs> but the Lord developed me in the furnace of affliction. In 2002, I became the youngest inmate in the prison system to receive a release date. At that time, the governor had a no parole policy. Nobody was getting release dates. It was a huge miracle, Vlad. But in California, the California governors have the single-handed power to block your release if you're arrested for murder. Mm -hmm. So for five consecutive years after 2002, I believe the evil spirits and maybe the angels of God, I'm just you know, envisioning that we're wrestling over my freedom because the governor would block my release. The parole board would grant me a release. Five months later, the governor will block it. Five months later, the parole board will grant me say, no, he's rehabilitated. He needs to go home. The governor will block it. In came, they had this historical governor recall in about 2003 in California, mm -hmm. which never happened before. And they ushered in as a governor for the very first time, this international movie star named Arnold Schwarzenegger, AKA the Terminator. Remember him? Mm -hmm. And I thought I was going home. He said he would not block nobody's parole releases. Mm -hmm. But five months later, Arnold Schwarzenegger blocked my release again. And I remember the fifth time my pro date was blocked, I was so discouraged, Vlad. Like I was in the midst of revival in prison. I was mm -hmm. preaching to thousands of people, seeing the power of God explode, telling people that God is still on the throne. Mm -hmm. And there I was, it was the first time it felt like God was a million miles away. Wow. And I was left stranded. I didn't know what to do. And then I walked around the prison yard, I cried. Um, I was confused. What was I going to tell my wife? My dad's getting old at this time. Shout out to my dad, huge supporter of my rehabilitation. But I didn't know what to do. So I went to the prison chapel. I remember I got down on my knees and I said, God, it doesn't matter anymore. Whether I go home or I spend the rest of my life in prison, I'm going to serve you no matter what. Wow, that's, and that's I, a decision right there. I wow. made this declaration like the three Hebrew kids Surrender. to mm. God and whatever demon in hell was listening to my faith. And I testify, Vlad, within a year of that declaration, uh, God Almighty had a sit down meeting with then Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger in Sacramento. And I don't know what he told him, but I like to believe he told him what he told Pharaoh 4,000 years ago, let my people go. And in 2008, after 16 years in prison, the Lord did the miraculous and set me free and gave me back to my mama. Come on. And now I'm on this pursuit to impact the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wow. Wow. That's so incredible. I think that's such a important lesson for a lot of people that are maybe listening right now. And you are in that difficult situation where things are getting worse. It seems like the delays are keep getting expanded and extended. And uh, maybe just come to the end of yourself. Give yes. up. Surrender. Um, make the decision even if not um, if you don't deliver me I will quit but Lord even if I don't experience this breakthrough I will still serve you as the Hebrew boys did as Pastor Brian did and and then God saw the breakthrough and even if it doesn't happen you don't get that breakthrough that continue to serve to serve God when it comes to you know Later on, you, you became a pastor. You you started to reach out to people. I was in your church. You have so many men and women who have come from the streets, from came from gangs. And now not, not only they are redeemed, a lot of them are being empowered by the Holy Spirit. A lot of them are leading campuses. And as of right now, how many campuses do you have? And what has the Lord been doing at the Chapel of Change? Well, we're one church in four locations. Uh, and the Lord has really been demonstrating the miracle of reconciliation at our church. Mm -hmm. Like he's bringing people that have been deeply broken by society, a diverse group. It's not just gang members uh -huh. and thugs, but brokenness hits everybody. That's true. And we have, you know, law enforcement, leaders in the community, but 
the commonal commonality is brokenness and despair because the enemy comes to still kill and destroy. Mm-hmm. But we're seeing this mir- miracle of reconciliation where the Lord is using our story to let people know that they could forgive people, Mm -hmm. that they could be delivered from the spirit of unforgiveness and bitterness and bondage and go to another level of freedom Mm -hmm. in the kingdom of God. Tell me about the forgiveness that took place about with your mother and the person that killed your brother. Yeah, so in about 1981, my oldest brother at the age of 15 years old was shot by a gang member in the face and he died. And this one tragic event ruined my whole family, t- threw us on a downward spiral. To this day, I got brothers who have been are still in prison or still on the streets. Mm. And about five years ago, I was wondering uh, who killed my brother? I was like wondering who killed my brother? And in summary, I asked a friend of mine who grew up with him, what was his name? And she said, his name is Donald. Do you want to see him? He's a friend on my Facebook page. And I was like, whoa, well, hold up. I didn't ask to see him. Mm -hmm. I just want to know his His name. name. But you know that Lord always has a plan. Mm -hmm. And so for the very first time, I seen Donald's face on Facebook. And the Lord began to wrestle with me, Vlad. He began to wrestle with me. And he said, I want you to bring Donald, fly him in and fly your mom in because I want to show the miracle of reconciliation to everybody, that the power of the gospel still empowers people to forgive Mm -hmm. and to be united in one in Christ. And after wrestling with God for a while, I finally said, God, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I called my mom and I'm the baby of the family. Mm. I said, mom, I, you're not going to believe this, but I'm in contact with the person who killed David. And I think you need to meet him. I'm willing to fly you in and fly him out. I really think you should meet a mom. Are you willing to meet him? And I'm the baby of the family. And after some quiet time, my mom said, I'm willing to meet him on one condition. If he goes to the gravesite of David with me. So Vlad, I called up Donald after I had my moments with Donald and forgiving him. I found myself coaching Donald, the guy who killed my brother, on how to like respond to my mom. And was he already a believer? He was, was already a believer okay. at was that time. Was he seeking forgiveness? He was seeking forgiveness and he told me subsequently that years ago he went back to my neighborhood to a, to a, a gathering and one of my relatives stabbed him in the neck and he almost died and on the way to the hospital he gave his life to the lord as a result of being stabbed in the neck by one of my relatives so he was seeking forgiveness and the lord is already working in in his life but it's a weird scenario for me i'm talking to the guy who killed my brother the guy who ruined my whole family and you're coaching him on how to us and deal with your mom yes it's like a radical display of the gospel and i'm like telling them what to do wow. so i tell them donald she'd meet you but you got to go to the gravesite. you I, I recommend you do that he said i'm willing to do it i'm willing to do it so a long story short uh, vlad i fly my mom down i fly donald down my mom's sitting in the front pew of my church nobody's there in comes donald And he's walking towards my mom, my mom's back faced against him. My mom starts weeping like a little child. She starts crying and she's saying to me, I can't do it, I Mm. can't do it. This is how strong the spirit of unforgiveness is and and bitterness is, right? It's deep, these things are deep, wounded warriors. And she's saying, I can't do it, I can't do it. And for a moment there, Vlad, I thought I made a mistake. Wow. For a moment there, I begin to doubt God was speaking to me because I'm going to the utter edge of uncomfortability. Mm-hmm. And I said to myself, if she continues, I'm gonna shut it all down. But as Donald came closer, the Lord gave my mom strength by his grace to open mm-hmm. his her eyes. And she opened her eyes and for the very first time, she saw the man who killed her firstborn baby son. And by God's grace, she forgave him. Mm. 
and she hugged him mm. and she went before our entire church and gave him a hug and demonstrated that God still gives us the power to forgive because the gospel ultimately is founded on forgiveness and that's reconciliation. Right, that's, right, that's right, that's right. And and but then Vlad, the moment came, gotta go to that gravesite. Wow. Deep, Vlad, deep. I take we go to the gravesite of David and we get out the car and if you can envision Donald he's in walking in the middle of my mom and I my mom has her ar arm locked onto hi him like the, uh, da David like no, David uh -huh. yes it was pretty deep and I actually got a video on my YouTube page that shows it and we're walking towards David's gravesite and as soon as we get to the gravesite the plaque the power of God is so overwhelming in this moment that Donald falls to the ground on mm -hmm. his knees. Now envision with me, Vlad, this guy who killed David is on his knees over the body of David because he's over the plaque, he's over the mm -hmm. gravesite. Mm -hmm. And he's on his knees weeping, weeping. And the Lord touched my mom and my heart at that moment, just spontaneously to lay hands on him and to rebuke and to cancel any curses that may have come upon his life as a result of killing David. And we actually blessed him. There's a picture, there's a video that we released on my YouTube page, Brian Wharf TV, where you see us laying hands on him and he's over metaphorically, the body of David, the grassy mm -hmm. area mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. gravesite. It was such a powerful display of the gospel, such a powerful display of freedom with my mom and even me to release him oh. of the burden and of the curse of murder and to actually bless him in Jesus' name. For the Bible says, bless those who curse you. But to live that out is pretty deep. Wow, I'm speechless. If this is blessing you guys, I know that it is. Let us know in the comments right now. Um, if you are watching this and you're battling with unforgiveness, you're battling with releasing hate, um, and as a result you're becoming this person that you don't recognize, God wants to set you free. It's not an accident that you're watching this video, that you stumbled upon this video. And right now we're going to ask you that you will come to Jesus that you will ask Him to be your Lord and Savior. And if you are a Christian, that you come to Jesus and you surrender to Him. Your hurt, your pain, your unforgiveness. Yes, forgiveness feels unfair because you're letting the, the bad person who did something bad go off free. But forgiveness is such a powerful tool that God says if we don't forgive, He doesn't forgive us. We received forgiveness from God. Imagine being the one who offended God, who caused him pain and suffering and God gave us His Son. We crucified, it was our sin that crucified Jesus and God forgave us. Jesus dying on the cross forgave and so forgiveness is not an option. This is not like if you feel like it, if you really want to, if you're really a nice Christian, if you want to go to heaven, you have to forgive. If you want to live in hell on earth and in eternity, then don't forgive. You might not been at the place where Brian's mom and Brian was at, but maybe you've been in the place where somebody betrayed your trust, where they cheated on you, where they hurt you, where they said some things, where they caused you maybe even physical pain. You can forgive. And not only you can forgive in some cases, like we've seen in this one, you can experience reconciliation. Some, for some people you can forgive them and they don't want to do anything with you and in fact that it will be actually healthy to walk away from those people because of maybe you were raped or you were molested or God forbid you were taken advantage of in some other ways that you forgive and you move on and those people need to face justice. But, but there are cases where so many times where God can bring such a beautiful reconciliation and it shows the beauty of the gospel. Brian would you pray for people right now that are watching, that are maybe battling and going through that of unforgiveness, dealing with that, struggling to release, struggling to love again, struggling to trust again, struggling to, to go to church again because they're so afraid because of some things that maybe that happened in their life that were really bad. 
Yes, and before I pray, I want to remind you that one form of forgiveness is giving that individual up to God. You're handing him over. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, vengeance is mine. So in forgiveness, what we're doing is we're just saying, Lord, I give that person to you. You're the ultimate uh, judge of the universe. You know how to uh, hand out punishment or whatever it may be, but I'm giving him to you. So if your hurt is so strong that that's all you can do for now, I'm gonna I'm gonna help pray you through just giving that individual that situation that pain surrendering it over to God for the Lord will take care of you so let me pray for you I would ask lift up your hands toward the screen just as a moment of surrender a sign of surrender father in the name of Jesus I pray for that person that is watching this video lifting up their hands as a sign of surrender to you and father I pray strengthen them even now mm. to give the offender over to you give the wound over to you give the hurt over to you in the mighty name of Jesus Lord in fact I just want to pray with them now and together we give that person to you. Yes. I give Dono to you who killed my brother. I, I, I just give them to you, Lord God. You're the maker of heaven and earth. I, I give them over to you. The pain that I felt of, of losing my brother, I give it to you, Lord God. And the person who's watching this, I pray with them right now. We yes. give the offender over to you. Yes. We give that pain to you. We yes. surrender to you, Lord. Come into our heart. Heal our heart. Heal our mind that we we might be free indeed, indeed, in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Thank you guys for being with us. If you are interested in Pastor Brian's uh, Worth Ministry, and he also has a book, um, all the links are in the video below. Um, so you can check out in the video below for this uh, for his ministry he has a youtube channel you can go and subscribe as well as he has books he has a book uh, his testimony in the book he was actually featured on the dr phil show and so you can see all of that information in the link below thank you for watching don't forget to like share and comment and subscribe share this with other people so that they could be blessed as well god bless you